We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast was produced, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present. It's 2001 and Merrick Watts is about to wake up Sydney. Alongside Tim Ross, he presents The Breakfast Show at the newly launched Nova 96.9. Merrick and Rosso. G'day Sydney, welcome to Nova 969. We're American Rosso and it's fantastic to be here. Merrick Watts, how are you feeling? I'm feeling very excited. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our radio station. The brand new station, the first uh, station in Sydney. Every morning they play some songs, tell some jokes and get people ready for the day. They've earned the slot after coming to Australia's attention as comedy duo Merrick and Rosso, building a huge fan base, selling out live shows across Australia. This studio will be Merrick's home on radio for the next 10 years. And today, almost 15 years later, we're back behind the same microphones. I'm Matt Middleton, and this is Head Game. Today, Merrick Watts on fame, self-reflection, and finding lost confidence. I've got Merrick Watts opposite me, but we're in a completely different situation this time, Merrick. You are on my head game podcast. And last time you were sat in front of me, um, a black hood was pulled off your head (laughs) and uh, no smile, no comedian in sight whatsoever. And uh, as you say, which we dig into now, your life changed from that moment onwards. Uh, But before we get into that, what's it like being back in the Nova Studios where it all started for you? Well, over 20 years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of the foundation members of this radio station's radio network. I was one of the first two people, my um, my business partner, Rosso and I, and my, he was on my, my on-air partner, who were the first ones to be employed as on-air announcers for the entire radio network for the entire country. And we kind of had the opportunity to set the tone and the culture for, for a radio station, which is like a once-in-a-lifetime So there were no rules or regulations? You sort of just <laughs> no. made them up as you went along? No, it was really <laughs> loose in those days. It was <laughs> really – and we were loose units within a loose unit, so we were pretty, we were pretty wild. But it was – uh, an amazing opportunity. At the time, I was kind of cognizant that it was a great opportunity, but it's amazing to be, um, you know, 20 plus years down the track and still see, you know, my name in the foundation walls here, literally, and uh, and to be in the studios and still have great relationships with people here. It's it's a, a phenomenal feeling. Take me back to that moment when you got that call to, to, do, to do radio and... Yeah, that change of, of of life. How was that? I think there was two parts to it, Ant. There was like there's – in 2000 – at the end of 2000, uh, Ross and I got a call about this new radio station. And, um, you know, we were already doing quite well. We are touring a lot and we had a good little kind of, um, you know, a really good base following. Uh, but it was not broad. And uh, then we got a call to, to come and uh, do this – this gig at Nova and to be the breakfast show. And we, at the time we thought we're the most unsuitable blokes. You know, we are just, we're too loose. Like we don't have the disciplines or anything like that, but we did have a very high application towards work. We were like, we've got a really good work ethic and we knew it. So we thought it, this is an opportunity that we're more likely to regret if we say no than if we say yes. And, you know, it's the whole thing. If you can get it wrong either way, so you may as well, you know, if you are going to get it wrong, get it wrong by having a crack at it. So we had to go and then it was a, I think people thought it was a meteoric rise to, you know, to becoming number one uh, in the, the city and to having, a, you know, a huge following um, across the country. But the fact is it was a grind. It was a grind for probably four years, I reckon, before we got to number one. Mm-hmm. And I think people just think it was an accelerator Forget that. As always. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, do. yeah. They just think, wow, because you were the biggest stars on radio. Yeah, there's, definitely. there's no no two ways about it. You were, yep. you know, when you spoke about radio in Australia, you two yep. came up at the top end. Absolutely. People don't realise the, you know, the sort of the iceberg effect, do they? You know, they look at, the, look at the tip of it and they don't realise what goes on underneath. Yep. So you say there was four years of, of grind. How yep. was that? Um, I think for the first kind of year, you're just excited by what you're doing and it's new and you're just applying your trade as it were. And then you start to learn a bit more and you hone your skills and then you, you, you dial in. And then you get to that moment probably in about, you know, two to three years where you start thinking, is this going to work? You know, have I committed to 
a lame duck, have I committed to something? Because, you know, the needle wasn't pushing up as fast as we would have liked and we had incredible aggressive competition, like really brutal competition. Nowadays I think radio is a far more less hostile environment. Yeah. Openly, whereas in those days it very much was, and we were we were coming into upset people, and we did a good job of it. But there was that moment where we were like three years into it, and we were having a good time, and going, "All right, well, where are the results?" And you start having those questions of belief, and and I, yeah, I'd, the free rides over now. We need to start performing. Yep. We need to start bringing in results. We need yep. to start bringing in yeah listeners, etc., yep. etc. Et yeah, it becomes yep. real, doesn't it? Yeah, and that was it. That was a moment there, probably at about three years, where people look in, it's like going, "You've had your time to settle." You've got your base. Now we need to see you perform. Now we see the results. Yeah. yeah. And so we just went, all right, well, if that's the case, and we put our foot on the gas. We certainly got them. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just it was just hard work. But there was definitely a moment where we're going, shit, have we made the right decision here? But like anything, you just persevere, just persevere and, and eventually get the results. You said in your own words, and I'll quote you on this and tell me if I'm wrong, that during that time you were a bit of a douchebag. I, I became – there was a moment there – at the real height of, of our success where, you know, I look at myself there and go, that was, you know, a really massive high in my career. But personally, I was probably not anywhere near my best. And what do you mean by douchebag? Break that down because anyone that, that's met you, no one said has even mentioned the word douchebag or idiot or, no, it's more you like know, so, so what made you guy. think that you were a douchebag? <laughs> you know, to be, to, to self-analyse yourself like that or, you know, and to self-reflect like that, what 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 made you think, right, I'm, I'm being a douchebag at the moment, I'm being a bit of an idiot? I think for a lot of people, you know, you need an, an epoch and you need something in your life that makes you reflect it forces you to reflect. So I'd taken no time for self-reflection until uh, the time of my father's death. And then when my dad died, I was really close to my dad, not as a child, but I was very close to him as an adult. And he was, you know, he was my friend and he was my father and he was my mentor. He was so many things to me. And so when he passed away, he died of cancer. And when he died, I... Um, I had a look at who I was. I became, I just had a bit of a stop down and thought, well, I'm, I'm the next generation now. This is on me. And how am I going about things? And I started working um, externally with different groups who, of people who I really admired. Uh, there's a group called Working Dog who produced television in this country at the highest level. And I worked with them and I looked at how they did things and I was looking at how I was doing things and the way I was operating and my behavior versus other people's. And I went, who do you want to be? I know who you are and I know what you're doing, but who do you want to be? Do you want to be that person? And it's not about being a clown or being funny or anything like that. It's about how you carry yourself with others. And I was like, I'm not comfortable with that person as he is right now. I want to be in the hype as well, right? Yeah, it's, it's, hundred percent. It's, it's the hype. I, you know, I've, I've been there before. You know, when you're at the top and you, you can get caught up in this hype and you almost lose who you are. You lose your identity. And like you just said, you hit the nail on the head there. You don't like who you are around other people. Yep. Was there a moment that you thought, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got to switch things up? Yeah, I think I really just took a moment. Like it was probably only a period of about a few weeks in hindsight where I looked at myself and thought, I, I want to be better than I am now. And I also too, at the time, I didn't really think about what the sacrifice might look like, but the sacrifice can be things like, you know, that the highest level, you know, because you, you're giving everything to achieve that. You do everything to do that thing, but does that give you that internal balance? And I was out of balance. There's no doubt. Everything was focused on winning, winning, winning. Nothing was focused on being grounded or rounded as a person. Um, and I just made a conscious decision that I would look a little bit towards myself and, and start looking at how I conducted myself with other people. And I've since then, I've never changed. I've, always, I've only kind of doubled down on that and looked at how I am around other people. Now, sometimes that can be um, comforting or it can be confrontational. Yeah. But whatever it is, it's genuine and it's real and it's for good outcomes, not for, not for bad and not for selfish outcomes. And in 2009, everything comes to an end. How did that come about and how did you feel, mate? Because I can, I know what it's I didn't like. get married in 2009. You didn't? So, <laughs> <laughs> it was 2006. <laughs> 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 
I'm sorry, everything came to an end twice. Sorry, in 2006 when you got married, but yep. um, your career in 2009 when uh, everything came to an end. Yeah. Well, how did how did that come about, and and what was going through your head? Um, I was working with Rosso very closely. We're still doing, we were doing radio and television and we're doing live work and we're doing everything. And we are probably at that stage too, uh, I was, my son was born that year and, uh, he was born in June, um, of 2009. And I just, again, had another, another stop down. One of those big personal moments where something in your personal world can reshape how you think about yourself. Um, as a person and what you're doing. And uh, Rosso and I um, fractured and we we split up at the end of uh, 2009 and it was brutal. It was tough. And it's not something I really talk about a lot, but I think people know we're good mates now and we have a very, very good relationship uh, because, you know, it's like anything. You can have blues with your brothers, but they're always your brothers. Um, but it was really devastating at the time. But, you know, I was – focused on wanting to to follow a certain trajectory, a certain path that I felt innately was the right way to go. And that was probably in conflict to the way we were doing things and the way we were working together. But also too, I think we just exhausted ourselves as a unit. Like we'd exhausted, yeah. we'd done everything together. We'd done everything. We'd lived together at periods of time. It was crazy. And then it was just – okay, now I've got my own family, now I've got different priorities. Yeah, and it is a priority shift, isn't it? Especially when you start to have children, you start to get married, like you said, your priorities start to change. You've got to now think about, you do have to think about number one, and that number one is you and your family and almost your business yep. partner and, and work does if you've got your priorities right come number two even though yep. it's very close one does affect the other but you've got to change that those, those priorities you've got to shift yep. those priorities so where, what do you do after you know when everything breaks down and you decide to go your own way and what happens to Merrick Watts so then I kind of started to forge my own individual identity which I to be honest I thought was going to be a lot easier than it was and it was very difficult and it's taken a long time and it's still, we're still not separated. You know, there's always this tether, which I'm really happy for actually. We've got a great tether, but there'll always be, it's Merrick and Rosso and that's fine. Um, but trying to forge my own identity, I thought would be pretty easy. Do you know what? I thought exactly the same when I left the military. I thought, you know, I've got to forge my own identity. I've got to find, you know, a new me and fit into society. I thought it was easy, but when you've, you know, done a decade plus yeah. or, and you probably a couple of decades having done stand-up, you yeah. know, comedy in the beginning, that tether never leaves you, does no, it? No, never. <laughs> you no. You try and cut it off yeah. and then it just reconnects and it, you try and cut it. So you just have to try and accept it somehow, obviously prioritise what you need to do, but acknowledge that, that that's always going to be there. Well, uh, here's a question for you, Ant, because I reckon so much of it is around, you know, problems – that people face, and particularly, I think for for men that I know anyway, is identity. If you have if you have a crisis in your identity, other things will flow on from that. That is actually that's the tip of the spear is your identity and how you see yourself. And when that's fractured, then you start to see things like you know poor personal habits, um, uh, anxiety, depression, all those things. For me, I, I see it a lot. It actually starts with that lack of identity or and, 100%. and that's dispossession for one reason or another. You leave the forces yeah. or, or whatever. You it lose is. your identity, you start to lose your direction in life, you start to lose, you know, you start to tread the wrong path to try and find it. And it's a whole trial and error scenario that goes on and sometimes that trial and error doesn't end too good, it ends in a yep. black hole, right? Yeah, yeah. When did you actually realise that actually this is a lot harder than I thought? I finished radio totally in, uh, I think it was 2017 or uh, I think it was 2017 and it was. And I left on really good terms. I had great relationships with everyone, but I'd done 20 years. And I was like, I need to, yeah, I'd done 20 years of radio. 20 years of it's radio. It's a long mate. time. Wow. <laughs> well, that's, that's a long time. I yeah. didn't realise that. Yeah. And it was, cool. it was really, and it was at a high performing level and I was like, I've got to, I've got to do something different. I've got to get out of the fishbowl and I've got to just do it, leave whilst I still love the people, yeah. love the mm -hmm. industry, and I've got good relationships. I don't want to leave on a bad on a bad way. So um, and it was brave, but it was time. So I, I left and then it was probably like the first, again, like, you know, after working with Rosso, the first 12 months it was like, oh, this will be easy. 
I'll be able to just transition quite quickly into something else. And it didn't quite happen as fast. And I was like, okay. Then there was another year of that in 2019 where I was like, okay, this is becoming a problem. And I started just sleeping in a little bit more, a few telltale signs, the disciplines start to drop off. Um, my fitness was okay, but it was not great. Um, Think about depression. The yeah, bit of definitely. The, the, yeah, because you were just saying there, uh, and that sounds like the signs of, of yep. being depressed. Yep. You know, slowly, you know, like you said, you know, decreasing, yep. everything, staying in bed, not being motivated, not hitting the gym, starting to, you know, spend time by yourself, locking yourself in your house. Yep. And yeah. And, you know, doing bad habits was the first thing. So, you know, drinking, um, like during, drinking during the week, which is not something that I was, you know, really accustomed to. Um, and the exercise and those poor disciplines started to creep in. Like you say, it's just like a, mm. it's death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, it is, yeah. But I was lucky enough that like just literally one day my wife was taking my kids to school and I was like, I'm not even out of bed. This is ridiculous. Like this is something is uh, – Something sent- is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. The frog is boiling. Yes. And I went, I've got to, I've got to do something about this. Something has to change and I need something dramatic. I need something to to really pin and inspire me to to shake myself out of this because I, I, I'm ultimately responsible for it myself. I can go and tell people that I'm feeling this way. I can, you know, exhaust myself by um, getting to my own head about it or I can look to take some action. I love what you just said there. You know, the penny drop moment was when – your wife was taking the kids to school when you're still in bed. I can imagine what that's like as a father because I would I would also think to myself, right, you know, something isn't, even though, like you said, it's like a death by a thousand cuts and, it, you know, it becomes the norm because the because the de- de- degression is so slow. Mm. It's, you sort of fit into that norm then you have that sort of moment where you're just like, yeah. this isn't normal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, um, what kind of a dad? You know, you start questioning yourself. Then, Correct. You? It's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. I was like starting to question myself as a father, yeah. as a husband, as a provider. And I was going, well, what? This is not me. Like I, I'm I'm used to long yeah. hours of work. Yeah. Strenuous. Up nice and early, yeah, yeah. disciplined, hard you know, work. punctual, yep. hard work, yep. get back, yep. close that door. Now it's family time, spend time yep. with the kids, spend time yep. with, with your wife. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do exactly the same. And it was it was like one of those moments where I, I could see it. I, I don't think that I was fortunate enough. I think I, I caught it before it became a real problem. And I was very f- lucky in that, that I recognised that I had two great pieces of luck. Number one, I recognised it and had the ability to see it for what it was and, and appreciate it and sit just sit with it a bit and go, all right, well, this is the thing that I need to fix before it goes plummeting. Because I'm on, I'm on a downward trajectory and I can feel it, but I haven't hit the bottom and I don't want to hit the bottom. So how do I climb back up? And I remember thinking at the time, if I've descended, I'm going to have to ascend. And that means I'm going to have to literally claw my way out of this shit. And at that time, SAS Australia came along. So you were at your lowest ebb or of your 20 odd years in yep. your career, yep. just finished radio, you're finding yourself, you can't get out of bed, you're drinking yep. um, heavily, you, you, you're not being a good father, not being a good husband, all of these telltale signs are, are hitting you. And then, and then SAS comes along. What yep. do you mean by SAS comes along? Do you get, do you get a call from production? Uh, how, how does that? change your life ultimately um so <laughs> and, and at that stage when you were probably in you you're like sod that there's no way in a million years i'm doing that well oh, that's the funny thing is like i reckon that that's what people would commonly think and i've actually told people that but the truth be told really is i saw i read one day that um they were going to make sas in australia uh who dares wins would be made in australia called sas australia and i was just like that's it that's it that's wow. it. That's it. And I rang up my agent and I said, you have got to get me on this show. And she goes, but I don't, I, it's a reality television show. And I said, you've got no idea what this show is. Because I knew it. I knew I'd seen the show. And I was like, that's insane. Your agent makes a few phone calls. Yeah. And they said, funnily enough, um, he's been earmarked for this. And I was like, oh, okay. They said, he's, he's been put on a list of, of people to have a look at. 
And they said, why? And they go, because we know that he's got a um, uh, an interest in the military and a respect for the military, but also, too, we just think he'd make an interesting character. So you had an interest in the military and yeah, a respect definitely. for the military, yeah. Definitely, mm. always have. Well, when, I was, when I was a kid, and there was only two things that I really had any interest in as a boy, like as, as far as an occupation goes. From the age of about 12, um, I only ever saw myself doing one of two things, and that was either being a comedian or being in the SAS. Not a soldier, not in any other capacity, only in the SAS. Wow. That was it. That were the only two things. And the first book I read voluntarily um, was a book on the SAS and I knew about David Sterling. I knew about the story and I was absolutely captivated. And that were the, that were the two things. So at your lowest ebb, your sort of childhood dream, I suppose, which is, you know, not not too far-fetched to say, your childhood dream um, and the show pops up. Yep. And then, boom, when did you get the phone call to say... You want it? Oh, my agent rang me up and said, um, <laughs> uh, "SAS Australia want you for for the show." And I was just like, "Yes!" Wow, you give me goosebumps, I was man. Pumped! I yeah. was pumped. Like instantly, I just went, "This is it!" And I thought, "I cannot." From this day, I cannot think about anything else. I've got to focus myself. I because I didn't want to go on and just be a number. Yeah. I wanted to go on there and be a contender. See, I love this because I don't see this side of SAS. All I see is you <laughs> on day one, the very first minute of the very first hour, absolutely shitting yourselves yep. um, with your eyes like saucers. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting to see how much effort and um, time and preparation you put into this. So you get the phone call. What? goes through your head do you start training how do you start training would you seek advice or do you just go right listen i've read enough books to and i've i'm going to watch sas how do you prepare yourself for it well it's pretty thorough like I, I took it very seriously i take everything including comedy very very seriously so i was like okay if i'm going to do this i'm going to prepare myself properly so the first thing i did is i went out and bought a um a, a plat attack backpack like a you know a, an actual army backpack and I started pack marching with weight because I knew that from- How much weight? Uh, <laughs> Come on, be honest, be honest. I started with 10 kilos and did five yep. kilometres and That's I was good. like, shit, this is brutal. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But before, by the time I got to go on the show, six weeks out from the show, I'd done 31 kilometres with um, over 40 kilos on my back. Yeah. And I went, That's, that took me six hours. I lost five toenails. My feet were destroyed. My back was ruined for a day or two. I could barely walk, but I'd taken the mental win. And I was like, I know now that I've prepared myself enough. I'm in, in the right zone. So I've kind of, you know, started very, very small. And over the period of time for the training, I just continually just. Is that what you done was pack marching? That, that I went to the gym three times in that entire time. Yeah. And the rest of it, I just trained at home. I got a ladder and hang, uh, hung a ladder between two beams and I would just cross the ladder until my hands were ripping yeah, apart. Upper body strength yep. and grip. Yeah. Yep. Good. So I went and had a look at what um, uh, preparation was required for special forces selection and looked at it and I went, it's not about, you know, lifting bars at the gym and looking at yourself in the, the mirror. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's about good cardio. So running, running at a pack weight and more than anything, putting myself in discomfort, being prepared for what was coming. The pack marches are uh, invaluable because there's no sport out there, no uh, competition out there where you cover extreme weight with extreme, uh, extreme distance with extreme weight on your back. It doesn't exist. And that's where we always have the advantage over the recruits because, you know, I could stick 10 kilos on your back and I could have 30 and I'd still be at the top, be at the yep. front, you know, out, out, out marching you. So that's always a bit of advice I would always give. And you started right, you know, 10 kilos is, is, is right. You know, when you join the military, you start with 22, 25 pounds, you know, through basic yep. training, you work your way up to your sixties and then in the Marines up to your eighties and special forces up to your hundred pluses. Um, this is pounds. So yeah, for you 50 odd kgs. So you prepared well there. Did you prepare any, Anything for, for you know, for the cold because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you probably knew you was going to be wet and cold yep. because that's the killer. And also, you know, the the interrogation because at yep. this stage interrogation was, was a huge part of it. Yeah, look, the, the cold, I started doing ice baths and preparing my body physically for it and pushing it a little bit. And there was one time where I pushed it too far and I, I think I got a touch of hypothermia um, from spending too much time in it. Um, but... 
having said that too, I was like, okay, I've got a handle on the cold now. I don't like it, but I understand what it's going to be like now. So when it, when I get to that point, it'll be familiar and known. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. I was familiar with the, you know, the pain of, of doing stuff, uh, under duress. Um, but the, the, the preparation for the cold and, and everything else is, is still not enough for when you're actually there. <laughs> like it's never, there's never, there's never enough, but that the first interior, season was brutal. Oh, so cold. I mean, and watching other people getting hypothermia in front of you for real yeah, yeah. is really quite confronting. You go, we are absolutely this, that's, yeah. you know, there's, People can look at it as a TV show, but it is not a television no, show when you're in there. It's not. It's a course. It's a military, yep. high-end military course. It's and it's relentless. You know, it is. It's absolutely relentless. Any more training before you before you start day one on, on the course? Um, I did do. One of the things that I was most concerned about was actually the interrogation. Yeah. I think we all were. Mm-hmm. I think genuinely the the recruits that I saw towards the end, we were probably all wondering how that would go because we knew it was going to be tough because also too, it's like we knew that we we're going to be broken down and we knew that um, the DS would go for our brain to the end and try and crack open the nut. So it was about preparing ourselves mentally for that and putting ourselves in um, difficult positions. So I, I did stress position training on myself. Oh, you did? Yeah. Talk me through the, um, a stress position in in your house, you know, oh, Merrick man. style. Come on. <laughs> Come on. This is embarrassing, <laughs> but it's true. I um, I woke up one night and it was probably about 1 a.m. I set my alarm clock for 1 a.m. and it was very cold. It was winter. And uh, I stripped down to just my underpants and I went into the garage in my house and we had like a utilities cupboard there and I went in there and it's completely black. And uh, so I stripped down almost completely nude and then I put myself in standardised stress positions and um, also played horrific soundscape that I could find off the internet, anything that I could find that was brutal. Yeah, white for, noise. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. brutal white noise and, mm-hmm. and horrific soundscapes. And I put the headphones over my ears and I put my hands up against the wall over on my knees yeah. and I'd be there for half an hour or more, 45 minutes, and then I'd cycle out. And the first 15 minutes I'd never experienced anything. I was, it was awful. I was actually like felt scared, like legitimately. I was going, I don't – this is horrific. This is not it's like bad. anything. Then after about two hours of this – my wife has woken up and she's gone, where is he? And she's gone, where the hell is he? So she's gone right around the house, checking all the rooms, going, oh, he's up to some training thing. Where's he gone? She's gone right through the house, going and checks the, the kids' bedrooms. Maybe he's gone to sleep in there. Doesn't know where I'm at. Starts to get a bit panicky. So she goes out to the garage to check to see if my pack's there because she's gone, oh, he's probably yeah, gone he's probably for Yeah, he's probably got on a night march yep. or night navigation, whatever it may be. Pack's there. It's all sorted. She goes, oh, no, where is he? And then for some reason she's just gone over and opened up the cupboard and there's me in a stress position with my hands against the wall and headphones on. And she goes, what are you doing? And I said, go away, I'm training. <laughs> I'm training. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, oh my wife is just training. like, oh, my God. Oh, so you took it serious, serious. That because that's that's the preparation yep. needed to you know we go through loads of preparation before we actually get on selection. We do a pre aptitude, um, you know, having been picked anyway. Then a pre aptitude of a couple of weeks, which has an eighty percent failure rate before you even go on selection. Because selection, believe it or not, UK Special Forces selection, you know, um, suffers deaths. You know, because the mm. training is so real. You know, mm. that it's not uncommon for. Um, you know, one or two people to to die on selection. Mm. Um, so you you prepared yourself extremely well, even though it was two weeks. But two weeks is a long time when it comes to the pressure, the stress, the just the relentlessness that we put mm. you through um, yep. is absolutely phenomenal. And to go from being a civilian, this is what I love doing it from being a complete civilian. This isn't army training. This isn't you know power training this isn't conventional this is you know sf training we're expecting you to operate at heights with ropes when you're physically psychologically and emotionally drained to have your own life in your own hands even though obviously of course there's safety elements behind it but when you're on that rope and you're low and you know that's you you're you've got your own life in your own hands uh when you tip up on day one so you you, you it sounds like you're prepared when you tip up on day one 
um, on and you're on that parade square. What's going through your head? <laughs> oh, I was just like, oh, I have all the training I've done has not prepared me for this. <laughs> It was just like it is shock and awe, and it's like that for days. It's like it's it's like you're saying. It's like you, your eyes shock of are, capture. Right? Yeah, it's just amazing. Like it, it's becomes incredibly real very very quickly. And what I loved is that how serious it was, both from from the DS and also to from you know my fellow recruits. Everyone was there to try and get the experience. And for me, I, I loved that because I wanted to. I wanted to get the most of the experience, everything. I wanted the pain. I wanted the achievement. I wanted the longevity. I wanted all of it. There was not a single part of it that I didn't want to experience. And this you wanted because you're in a bad place, right? So this was almost, you're almost exercising your demons in, in, a, in a therapeutic kind of way. I know it sounds a bit sadistic to say that, but, you know, you're, you can challenge your demons. You're out yep. there now. You can scream. You can shout. You can, you know exercise this pain that you're feeling through through tasks that we're giving you. Yep. And it, it's for me it was about the purpose of it was to regain my confidence. I was always a very confident player and I'd lost it. That's and you know falling into the trap of the malaise um, mentally that I was experiencing before I went on the show was it it was about losing confidence and identity. I'd lost my identity because I'd associated it too much with one thing. So I had to reform my identity of who I was and what that meant. So to get the confidence back and to get the identity back, this seemed like the perfect thing because I thought if I can do this, if I can just get to the end, and even if I don't pass the selection, even if I j- can just finish the course, it will be a massive mental achievement for me and I will feel really, really good. And for the first three days or four days, I was not feeling very good. Because I I basically managed to fail everything. I was just failing after failing, but I knew that that was part of it. I knew it was designed to make me fail. I knew that I would I was going to feel that. So I prepared myself mentally for that that I was going to fail. But every time we would do something else, that was my opportunity again to succeed. It was. The do you next think that falling off the cliff um, from your radio career um, to coming onto this course, which you hit the nail on the head, you're going to fail the first few. Yeah. You know, did the acceptance of failure almost feel like you've you've been there before yeah. you know that you've embraced it already so listen i'm gonna fail i've, I've actually you know fell from a quite a height already yep. um that part of it i can just brush off knowing that knowing that i can manage that and then and just survive each day i suppose yeah it's the acceptance mm-hmm. it's the Except, acceptance that's of the it. one yeah it's the acceptance that you know you you might have failed one thing but there's if you've got enough grit and determination, you will go again until you get it right. And it might not be the same task. It might be something else, but if you stick with it. But the failure is actually good. Yeah, isn't it? Because the, the thing about failure, you fa- failure is everyday part of life. Yep. You know, it's classed as a dirty word, failure, but failure is everyday part of your life like it is breathing. Yeah. You know, you're going to, I've failed up to now in my life and guess what? I'm going to fail to the day I die. Yep. The moment you embrace that and you realise that it's everyday part of your life and through failure, that's where your biggest lessons come from. Yep. You grow from it and you become a better version of who you are ultimately. Yep. And I learned that from quite a young age as well. Again, being in the military, just failing, failing, failing. And when you actually take the lessons from it, you go, you get, you, like you said, psychological resilience. You start to gain comfort. Well, actually, you know, listen, I'm going to try more because a lot of people, yep. they're scared of failure. Therefore, they don't commit. They don't try. And obviously, the more they try, the more you fail. Granted, the more you fail, the more you, 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 you have setbacks. But the stronger you become when you, when you, when you actually, you know, get through those setbacks. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, that point, it's like the old saying of, you know, what's better is to, you know, try and fail or mm-hmm. fail to try. try. Yeah, exactly. You've got to, you've got to, the failure is good because it teaches you the lessons. You know, look at a lot of successes in people's careers or, or lives. It's often been a result of several failures before it. And so you kind of bank them and go, Absolutely, mate. Every failure I take now, if I can absorb the failure, then I've I've getting closer to the outcome of success. And there's, you know, I saw it on on our show and on, on our course, there was people who couldn't handle the failure. It wasn't that they couldn't do things. They couldn't handle the failure. And they're gone, right? And they're gone. Yeah. And you see the cracks. Like I, I could see the cracks in some people before they would go. I'd go, they've already – It's the Mentally crack is – gone. Yeah. 
And as soon as you open up that crack, the water just runs in. It just it opens them up and you see it. And it's always off the back of a failure. So you've just got to keep driving forward until eventually. And I, I, you know, I remember very clearly when I had like one success where I was like, I think it was like on day four or something like that. And I went, I just needed that. I just needed that. And then it became this kind of concussive event where I was like, okay, now I'm starting to succeed. Now I'm starting to get these things right. I'm starting to make less mistakes. I'm starting to make more little goals, little achievements. I'm preparing myself better. I'll work harder before I go into an action. I will clear my mind. I'll get myself right. And then I will go to it as hard as I possibly can. And then all of a sudden it starts to build momentum. And before you know it, you know, this the, the You're halfway through the course, yes, right? It's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. And it is. You go, wow, you know, we're eight to 10 days in and I feel good. When we found out that you were a comedian, we were shocked because you weren't there to play, make jokes. You no. weren't there to mess around. You weren't there. You were there for a reason, right? Yeah. And um, you did. You got, uh, you know, halfway through. And I saw a turn in you. There's like halfway through the course, you know, you were sort of like the perfect grey man, which we're looking for. And then all of a sudden you go on this incline of of self I think it's self confidence or mm. self belief there's something that switched into you where you could thought to yourself I can do this yep. I can I can get through this and it's an instant change that we notice in certain individuals you were one of them that was very obvious it changes your life doesn't it it does there's the funny thing is that kind of that turning point was something that you said Ant right without doubt so uh, for people who didn't see the series um, that we had a day out in uh, an alpine region in Australia and it was a beautiful clear day, but it was cold and it was deep snow. And um, we had gone under some ice and we'd done a lot of, you know, kind of pretty hardcore work getting in there, but we had to ascend a mountain and we had a polk with about, I think it was 40 kilos on it. And I had two fractured ribs, which I'd been hiding from everyone because I didn't want anybody to know that I was injured. And, we had to get um, a harness on, put it around us, and then we had to drag the polk about five k's up a mountain in deep snow. And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, this will be. This is going to be a challenge, but I'm feeling okay. I'm at this stage. I'm feeling like I deserve to be yeah. here. Yeah, you've I deserve to be here. Spot on the course. But then we were gearing up to go, and I looked at my my sled, and my sled and my rig was back to front. And everyone else's, there was the leading edge was pointing <laughs> forward and mine was ass about. And I looked at it and I went, oh, this is bad. And we're just about to jump off. And I, I think I said to the DS, I said, um, my my sled's back to front. And that was just the look of, <laughs> of the DS was just like, I don't care. Mm. It's your problem, mate. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to get massacred in this now. So bang, the starter pistol goes as it were. Everyone's let off. And I'm still pissing around with my rig and I haven't taken a step and I'm seeing people 20 metres in front of me in the snow, 30 metres, 40 metres, and I'm going, oh, shit. And I went, I'm cooked. I'd almost resolved myself to the failure. Then you came up to me and you said something to me which just ignited me and it was, I expect to see you top four, number 10. And I went, I think he's serious. I think he really does expect to see me top four. So that's what I'm going to do. I wouldn't have said it otherwise. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I thought. I thought, why would he say it? Why would he bother saying that? Why would he say that if I'm already last? If he'd given up on me, he wouldn't bother talking to me. So what I need to do now is burn. And I just moved as fast as I could back to front. Taking him off. Yep. That's it. I remember it well because I was stood up on the high ground as you all come past and all of a sudden, you know, there's two people behind you. There's another person behind yep. you. You were on a mission. Yep. The snow was almost melting behind you. You were just like head down, fucking in the zone. Yeah. Um, and it was – it's joyful to watch it's a pleasure to watch when something like that happens because it's like what i thought and the words i said on day two or day three when you came in and sat in front of me 
they were proving me right. You know, when you just know, and you're like, you almost have a sense of pride because at the end of the day, you're my recruits. You know, I want what's best for you. I'm not there to break you. You know, if, if it's not for you, VW, if you've had enough VW, if you're there for the wrong reasons, then I'll get rid of you. It's, it's simple. But the sense of pride that you have, that we have as DS, when we see you making that switch, making that turn, because for us, it's, we, we're doing our job. Yep. Wow. Yep. This is working, what we're doing. I remember that that day well. And you got to the end and you were stood there proud as I yeah. can just remember chest was out, head was up. Yeah. You do you know, it, you were you were present, you were there. That was it. And that was the turning point. I think because I'd felt at that stage that you'd made an investment in me, right? Like I, I was it was probably maybe seven or ten days into something, and I felt like there'd been an investment in belief in me. And I went, I have to reward, I have to match this. So, you know, I giddied up and I got past the group and then there was, I remember being able to see the finish line at the top of the mountain and in front of me I had an Olympian (laughs) and another guy who'd represented Australia (laughs) and I was just like, oh, my God. And I went, fuck it. What's to stop me from doing this? Why why can't I do this? I've got this far. Don't don't settle for third. Go for first. And I just pushed through and at the top of the mountain, that's when I got that confidence. That's when I went, now I have the belief I have to get severely injured from here or nothing is going to stop me. Unless the DS decide to take me off the course, I will get to the end of it because I've been able to do this and the confidence. And I knew at that moment, I was like, like you say, chest out proud. I was like, I've done this. That means nothing. I can't have excuses for anything else. I've I done see it. a change in your demeanor, the, the change in 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 your gait, the change in the way you look, to the change. You know, just by a gaze, just by the way you compose yourself and 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 carry yourself. I can tell when when you know it's just like just small little um, observations. And I'm just like. Wow, and I, I can remember because we always say, "Who, who do you think is going to be here at the end?" Your name was always mentioned towards the back end of that. After that day, it was like the, f- the fire in you was just yep. ignited, right? And yep. it's just like having that self belief in yourself was was phenomenal to watch. And we don't ever, you know, have any bias or any favoritism because you know we people get to the end that you know have really really tried and we get rid of them. Um, but you're stood there. At the end of the course, Merrick, there's you, my comedian, which I don't see you as. It's really strange because I don't see you as a comedian. I, 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 it's really strange because. <laughs> oh God, I'm back in the interrogation room. I'm back no, in the but room. I've seen, I've, all, I've seen the rawest form of who you yep. are. You know, with with every, we all wear body armor and masks, and you yep. know, to do to get through life, and you know, to tackle uh, tackle uh, the outside world. But I've had the privilege of seeing you for who you are, which was super cool. But you're at the end. There's you. There's two AFL players, Sabrina, who was quite an absolute warrior. Yeah. And totally. then you've got the honey badger as well, who, yep. who again, has suffered. You know, he, he says that, you know, he's... Um, He's used to all that, all that, but you know, you could tell he was suffering from the cold. He was, uh, you know, that grit and determination that he had to get through. Um, and also, um, Mitch was it? No, uh, no James um, Magnuson. Jay, yeah, James Magnuson. Sorry, yeah, um, getting the two big fellas mixes up. Um, James Magnuson. Um, all four of you stood there. What's going through your head? Because you know you're at the end of the course. What's going through your head when all four of you are stood there? Do you think are you just proud to be at the end? Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's exactly that's all I was yeah. thinking. That's what I felt when I got to the end of selection because you know, knowing that a decision still has to be made. Yep. But I was just super proud to make it to the end. And I thought to myself, whether I've passed or failed, you know, if I get returned to my unit, I'm happy either way. But I'm just so relieved that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I, was pretty, I was pretty glad when I found out it was finished. But. <laughs> But at that stage too, you know, it was, it was out of my hands then. I was like, whatever happens from here, whether I pass the selection or not, I've, I know that I've given everything. There's nothing left. I can't – it's now out of my control. So I was actually really quite comfortable. I didn't think I would be comfortable with it, but I was I was like, no, I've, I'm proud of myself. I've done what I wanted to do and I don't feel like I've let myself down or I've let the DS down or let anybody down. I've done everything I could possibly do and carried myself in a way that I was um, proud of. That was the most important thing. I was like, I did this, but I did this with my own dignity intact and I, I, I did it the way I wanted to do it. So I was like, well, what happens from here is 
not inconsequential, but it was not it was not as um, important as I might have thought it would have been. But then having, you know, here that you, you've passed selection, it was just like, it was a wash. It was a wave of just euphoria just washed it. over my face. And I was like, holy shit, I've done it. Wow. And it was it was the most wonderful feeling. It was amazing. What I've loved about you and the scene in your journey um, after SAS Australia you just kept the momentum going. That's just given you a newfound identity, newfound yep. confidence. Yep. What, what has it done? Because you are on fire, mate. <laughs> it's, it's empowering. And I feel like the best for me is yet to come. I've been building since the show. I've been developing and building on things that will, will bear fruit and already are. But, you know, I was like... I, it changed my identity, but I cannot tell you how much of a gift it is. Like, I knew it was. And it was kind of, you know, uh, it was related to us that this was an opportunity for personal growth. And if you embrace that and you took that, then you would benefit from it. And as you said, like, I handed myself over from day one. I was went, I am, I'm here for you guys. I'll do whatever it is. I will act like you would expect me to act at every turn. And... By allowing myself to kind of succumb to the process like that, it allowed me to weaponize myself. So when I came off it, you know, after the bit of the very slow recovery um, physically, but my mind was as sharp as it ever has been. I was able, it was like a completely different person. And I'm, you guys say this, you know, you walk in one person and you come out another. And I, I know that to be true. I'm a completely different person to the person that went on that show. From the moment I was kind of, you know, bag snatched yeah. on day one to, you know, the moment I got home to my family, two totally different men. And I always say to people, don't expect, especially to the to the recruits, don't expect anyone to understand what you've been through because they can see it on TV, you know, they can, you can, you can try and explain it to them, but only the people that have been through that process. And that's where that sort of band of brotherhood comes from uh, yep. and sisterhood comes from. It's like, it's a case of, uh, you know, you've been through something like that, you know, don't yep. expect anyone else to take what you can from it, take what you will from it and use it to your advantage. And you've done that, mate. You've done that in spades because your life now I've just, give you a hug walking in you're solid mate you know this is year this is what four, four years, years. Yep. after you're yep. solid you're in good shape you look healthy you've got a spring in your step yep. and you, and it just looks like from that day onwards or from that moment onwards that you pass that you've gone from strength to strength there is no way known I would be the person I am now physically or mentally without doing that there's just no there is no doubt there's no process that I could have gone through there was no conversations I could have had with any professional on any level that would have been able to morph me into the person I am now. I it's, love that, mate. It's just not possible. I it's love just that. not possible. And it is profound and it is eternal. That's I think that, you know, uh, people see it as just a television show, fine. For me, it is the greatest gift that I have been given in my professional career. Everything else I reckon I earned and I worked for, but that was a gift. I was given the gift and I went, this is the gift of opportunity. I am not going to, I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to take every single grain of this. And then when it was done, I went, this is now transformative. This is the new me. This is my new life. I'm going to apply myself and change my identity. So, you know, I looked at what I was doing and how I was doing things and started applying my, my mind in different ways and the disciplines and the habits, you know, <laughs> so, you know, just, as a, a kind of lingering effect, I still wake up before 5 a.m. I wake up at 5 and I meditate and I exercise and I journal and I do all of those things that are good for me and then I go out and I attack the fucking world. Wow. Well, Merrick, I can tell you that you're certainly not a douchebag, mate. You are absolutely <laughs> phenomenal and you're the reason why I still do what I do. You know, huge inspiration and, and huge reason for me to carry on um, doing what I do. Thank you ever so much for coming in and being part of my podcast head game mate it's, it's been a pleasure to see you again an absolute gentleman and an inspiration to many thank you thank you thank you so much for joining me on head game if you enjoyed this episode make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of our incredible stories and leave me a review wherever you're listening i'm matt middleton catch you again next time